like I was drunk right now. <laughs> can, can I say this? Take three. I just want to say take three. And I hope you leave it in. This Man, says, if this doesn't work again, three. I'm just joining you. I'm leaving it all in your hands. Uh, you apparently gave, you gave me several times to practice, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now we have you just, you just like the idea about having this extra secret vault material. That's what you like that we'll pull yeah, out later. It's all my my master plan here. No, I think what it was is we jumped in. We were just having such a good conversation. It just was like I know. pulled in immediately and then forgot. I need I need an assistant. So one more time, give me your mm. your uh, introduction if you don't mind. Well, you did actually, it so I, wanna, I, wanna, I got a new a new intro to that, which is first of all, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs for winning the Super Bowl. That's oh yeah. Um, go. So I just got to put that in there. They just won yesterday. Um, but yeah, my name is D. E. Foster. Um, people just call me D. Um, I'm a benzo, benzo advocate. I work all over the place. I have a website called Easing Anxiety. It can be found at easinganxiety.com. I am host of the Benzo Free Podcast. Mm-hmm. We have about 115 episodes so far. Been doing it since 2019. Um, I'm also co-chair of the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group, along with um, Dr. Alexis Ritvo, a psychiatrist at CU Anschutz, um, Medical, Anschutz Medical Center, um, University of Colorado. And I also am a bunch of different research groups, um, we have some research papers published, working on some more, just started a new team. I just got, got involved with some research projects for ASAM and some other stuff and um, and do presentations um, all over the place. In fact, we're heading down to the RX and Illicit Drug Summit in Atlanta. We just found out we got our presentation there accepted. So um, oh, cool. I'll be going on there with Dr. Christy Hulf and Dr. Alexis Ritfo to present Benzodiazepine Safety Seminar, the only benzodiazepine seminar at the whole conference. So Wow. We're excited to, that they accepted that and accepted our proposal. So we're going down to present um, benzodiazepine safety down there. So it'd be pretty cool. That's um, Atlanta, April 10th to 13th, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Very cool. But so it's that kind of stuff going on is just keeping us busy, you know. So. Right, right. Where are you from? Originally from a um, little time in, outside Chicago, but mostly Kansas City, hence mm-hmm. the Kansas City Chiefs love. And I've now been in Colorado for 24, 25 years, so. Colorado, right? Okay. Yeah. So now I'm in Denver. We're north of Denver. My wife and I are. Um, um, two of us, no kids, but a lot of different dogs along the way. And yeah, I'm looking at getting another one here in the next few weeks. So yeah, I've been thinking we get another dog too. Are you? Yeah, but yeah. I, and I love that sleep. <laughs> I know, man. My wife, I, I can only keep her at bay. I love dogs, but I can. She's the one that she can't go more than a year without one. And we lost ours a little over a year ago. Uh, and so yeah, I think it's it's time she needs to have another dog in the house so i totally get it so yeah i've been i've been looking i'm, I'm getting closer to it you oh, know? yeah yeah i i had wolves uh hybrid wolves for about 10 oh, years those are beautiful yeah in fact i my last one you know he i put him in my book we both had written books and I, you know pub- published a book on benzo you know my my whole journey yeah. and some advice and yeah i saw some of your books on your site there yeah and uh, one of the last the the last page, I think it was the very back of the book. I have a picture of him in there, just because he was my okay. little buddy, and he practically saved me. You know, I mean, he dragged you know, me out I had of the bed. Same and... story, yeah. Mine was named Bear Aussie Shepherd Mix, and yeah, he was through all the hardest part of benzo withdrawal with me, and that was pretty. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty special. Yeah, it is. I mean, when you you feel so isolated and alone, and yeah. he was always there, and I even you know, appreciated him dragging me out of my comfort zone at times because I was getting so depressed yeah. laying there, you know, um, you know, especially at the beginning, like I had mentioned before we got cut off, uh, that I had been on 40 milligrams, you know, for 10 years. I dropped 20 right. milligrams overnight after going to the hospital with a heart scare because of, a, I guess what was a really bad panic attack and came home. And I just thought, I'm going to get off this drug quick. Let me cut 20 yeah. milligrams. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> you know, but you know, the doctor's like, well, 20 milligrams, you could cut them off the whole thing in two, three weeks. Yeah. That's, that's always not... the story. I know. Yeah. I've heard that many times. Yeah. So I was devastated, laid in bed for, like I said, probably four or five months. And yeah. I just kept waiting for it to pass, you know, and, and I was researching and, and I think I found like some information online. This is going back several years. So okay. you and I were actually coming off of this drug almost around the same time, right? Like, so yeah, I think mine, um, I mine started. I think my taper started or clo- actually finished it in 2014. Mine was 2012, like the end of yeah, 2012. Yeah, so pretty close. Like, yeah, yeah, so. right at the end of 2012. <clears throat> and so, as you remember, probably back then there wasn't a lot going on. Not like now. I mean, Ashton Manual is out there, and that was my lifesaver. Um, I know it's yep. for so many people, and there were a few organizations, but mostly discussion groups. Benzo Buddies, Ashton Manual. That was that was yep. the bulk of it. Right. Um, 
you know, some groups out in the UK, there was a couple of those out there mm-hmm. you know, that were doing some stuff, but that was, yeah, mostly it at the time. Yeah. A lot of, I, I found the Ashton manual. That was huge. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. And then I, I think I might've found Benzo buddies, but I remember even before that I was just watching, you know, videos on YouTube of people having panic attacks and, and horrific stories. Oh, yeah. And I was like, Oh my God, this is scaring the hell out of me. You know, I didn't know what I was in for. Same here. And it, and it yeah. was that slow realization of, wow, this is going to be serious, you know? And then every video was like, this is going to be way more serious than I thought, you know? And that, and that's part of it. And that, of course, you mentioned, I think, on the podcast I heard with you was, um, you know, PTSD is a factor too. And absolutely, this is an experience that, yeah. how can it not create some type of PTSD response? That's just, yeah. it's that traumatic. I mean, my, I was on, a, I was on clonazepam for 12 years tapered 18 months and i've been off now with a little over eight years but when i first discovered you know i was on it without warning i never even knew it was a problem like most stories are but it wasn't until probably 11 and a half years that i my doctor told me to get off and i then looked into it and that's when i saw the and horror stories and i had the panic attacks and, right um you know yeah it was it was pretty crazy um yeah. and it was it was hell it was pure hell at times i went through a, a, a horrible recovery um but you know the truth is and even besides my last podcast which we'll get into i'm doing so much better and that's the one thing i always want to make sure i emphasize yeah, is that right. i've come a long way from where i was and i think it's so easy to um you know maybe we, we we'll, when we dive into that i'll go into a little more detail because i wanted to kind of yeah. comment on a few things that you had mentioned um maybe maybe when we dive into that you want to bring that up and we kind yeah of talk yeah about it a little bit okay yeah for sure so <clears throat> yeah so like i said i before I was talking to you, I said, you know, I kind of felt bad because I didn't want my video to come across mm-hmm. as like, um, gotcha, or I'm attacking you or I'm judging or any of that. And or special, especially gaslighting like that. I'm really, really careful of trying to, you know, and, but what it was is I had multiple clients had sent me it. And even before they sent me the link, cause you know, we have our, our friends mm-hmm. and our fans and it's almost like a little mini army, you know, it and is, every time yeah. <laughs> like, guess what so-and-so said about you screenshot. Like, okay, stop. I don't, I don't care, you know. Did know. you see this? And you know, and it's like it's almost like we're 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 the army well, it's versus also the marine. Interesting. Yeah, I also think people think that we all know each other. Yeah, and <laughs> most of the time, we, I mean, I have a few people in the community I work with all the time, but it's about seven or eight people on these different groups. But all the rest of them, I right. mean, you know, I don't talk to everybody that often. We're so busy doing our own thing, as you know. Absolutely, that we just don't you know? So I I didn't hear your podcast. I knew of right. you, but I didn't hear your podcast until just you know, recently. So, yeah. And it's almost a criticism. Some, some, sometimes they get from people, they go, you don't know so-and-so you didn't see his yeah. video. I said, I'm video, I'm making videos. I'm exactly. Coaching. Yeah. This takes a lot of our time to do yeah. the work we do. So yeah, I agree. It's like a six day a week, uh, passion at this mm-hmm. point, you know, yep. but they, but they had sent me something and they were just freaking out. And I always know when there's something brushing through the community because everyone will suddenly be hitting me up about histamines or this or that. What are you, what's there, what's going on? Is it a full moon, you know? And they <laughs> hit me up and they were eight years. I, I mean, they were freaking out eight years yeah. later. I could just go back to hell. And I'm gonna, I'm like, what are you talking about? No, they no. sent me a link and I said, okay. So I, I listened to it and then I listened to some of, some of your other stuff. And, and then I thought, well, okay, maybe. And so what, so the intention was to provide a, a alternative rationale for some sure. of it. And, and right away I said, um, you know, I, I, I could be completely wrong. I don't know his backstory. I don't want to gaslight this person or anything. Exactly. The, 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 the point of me doing that video wasn't to come at you sideways at all. It was more or less to try to ease some of the tensions and say, guys, before you think that you're going to just wake up one day, eight years later, there's probably more to the story, right? There's probably there's some kind of word of the story. And you're absolutely right. And that's and, what they hear, know. right? That they just hear yeah. that you're going to be a hundred percent for eight years. And then, and that's horrific. I mean, that that is a horrific yeah. thought. Um, and and, I, and I, honestly, if you if you knew the number of times on my podcast that I said, now please don't use me as an example. My experience is very unique. I had some complications. I've had outside circumstances. I've had a lot of things go on in my life recently. Right. Um, so I I do say that constantly on my podcast. But no matter what, after eleven hundred and you know so many episodes, somebody's going to tune into the most recent one. 
And I maybe not, didn't make it as clear in that one. And so, and they get triggered by what you say initially. 100%. And that happens. And I totally get it. And I totally understand how easily we get triggered. I was there. I know what that's like. I got triggered so easily during that time. And I just want to say up front, that was never my intent ever. Um, sure. I have never intended to trigger anybody. I find, and I think you, tell me if you disagree with this, but it's very difficult for what David and I do. To do it, we walk a fine line. You know, we want to be honest, we want to be truthful, we want to be objective, but it's hard to share our stories without occasionally being triggering because right. this is reality, you know, mm -hmm. but to always make sure we're focused on encouragement and hope, you know, right. and that's, that's the thing. And I try to do that as much as I can, but yes, yeah, sometimes, and probably that episode, I probably should have been a little more careful in putting some caveats in it and, and focusing a little more on the positive. But, you know, I was I was in a wave and it was pissing me off. You know? Right, so, right. And it came across on the podcast. So yeah, I think that's part of it. You know, I don't even I wouldn't I don't even know if if if, if that disclaimer is necessary, per se. You know, I appreciate you saying yeah. that. But my my emphasis is it wasn't a gotcha or I'm going to look for people that I disagree with. It was just more, you know, them saying uh, this is going to be me. And I said, well, hold on. You know, let's and look I, at I, some things I get here. those responses. So what I'm saying is those responses I get all the time. I right. do get people saying, hey, your last episode triggered me or this was this. And I'll mm -hmm. often talk about that in the next episode. And I say, gotcha. hey, I got this notice. Here's what they sent to me. And here's my response. And it does remind me, and I try to keep it in my mind, that that's something I always want to be cautious of. One of the things I do regularly on my podcast is share Benzo stories. So people send their stories into me, and I often share them on the podcast. Yeah. Those, as you know, can be incredibly triggering. Right. So I'm always putting caveats in front saying, hey, you know, you got chapters for my podcast. Skip over this if this is a concern for you and go to the next section. You know, we won't have that in the next yeah. section, but the Benzo story, <clears throat> you know, may be triggering. Now, sometimes they're success stories, and I say, hey, this is a good one to check into sure. because you're going to see how this person overcame it but for many of them they're still in a very um you know difficult state and that right. comes through and it's but i tell you that 95 and I, you probably have the same effect but 95 percent of the feedback i get even more so is all positive oh sure. and because yeah. what we're doing is we've created a connection you know i think just as many people that might get triggered far more people are saying oh my god that was me or i had that symptom or i still had that symptom two years out Right. And I think that connection we create is probably where we do the most good. Sure. You know, right. Absolutely. And look, I mean, people were going to get triggered anyway. You know, I, I remember. Absolutely. absolutely. I remember saying in a video, I said, you know, 99% of people recover from benzos. And then yeah. I had all these me text messages and emails going, why didn't you say everyone healed from benzo? I said, I said 99.9. But that's the mental state of benzo <laughs> withdrawal. We know that. It's like that irrationality <laughs> kicks in. And you're going to grab onto the one kernel of negativity, and that's what you're going to ruminate on. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know that. So. And, and, and But it's it's damned if you do, damned if you don't for me, because if yeah. I say, no, everybody heals, then somebody yeah. will say, well, I didn't heal. And so I said, look, the reality is 3,000 on average people die of aspirin every year in this country. Yeah. Right? Aspirin. So to sit back and say that benzos, you know what I mean? But so it's, it's a fine line you're walking. It's like the, the yeah. message is... The overwhelmingly, the odds and probability are in your favor. You're going to heal. I mean, unless you had a yeah. well, really, if you look at the you stats, know, yeah, I don't even know if you've seen some of these, <clears> and you might have seen different stats. So yours may disagree with me, but you know, and the stats are all, all over the board. But the amount of people that come off benzos without any major difficulty is probably more than fifty percent. So most people, oh, yeah, right. first of all, can come off the drug. Some people without even having any serious symptoms. The rest of the people, but as far as the people who have a protracted state, so say lasting more than a year or so or right. several months, whatever, is probably more like 10% and might even be less than that. The truth is right. we really don't know. We There's right. not been any total study on, you know, objective study. Um, and, I, you know, we do our own studies and stuff like that. But, of course, ours is actually a self-reporting bias. So this right. is people that are coming to us needing help. So ours is not accurate in the world you know as far That's as the right. overall population so and we know that we put that under limitations on our studies and everything yeah. but the odds are it's probably 10 percent or less might have some kind of protracted state for people sure. that have taken benzos long term okay but even that might only be six months it might be a year those right. of us who are eight years out yes there are some of us but we are a minority and it is rare yeah the thing is the work we do attracts those people so most mm -hmm. of the work I do, I'm talking to that minority. And it sounds like a majority to the people who listen right. to me. 
but it's right. not because the people who come off them easily, they never write into me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, they don't need me. They don't need you. They don't That's need right. our help because they're doing fine. Right. And unfortunately, we don't hear from those people. Mm-hmm. You know, so I always want to say that yeah. for encouragement, it's like, look, this is a minority group. Yeah, people mm-hmm. who are eight years out and still have symptoms, like myself, it's rare. And right. I, there were complications that added to me. I did some things wrong, you know, right. that probably also added to maybe some of the neurotoxicity that I think I faced from this from this situation. Sure. Um, so there's a, you mentioned on your podcast when you were rebutting was, I think there's more to this story. Mm-hmm. You were a thousand percent correct. Absolutely, there's more to this story. There's so many factors that came into play, and I'm always working through those factors in my head. And right. I always, always trying to be objective as to what might be causing my current state. But right. the truth is, until recently, I have healed 80, 85 percent. Right. You know, even me, who had a lot of problems and a lot of complications, I still have living a pretty normal life, and I love life now, and I'm very positive, I'm very optimistic. Right. right. This last podcast caught me at a difficult time. Right. And, you know, it was COVID. It was benzos. I came off of two years of taking care of my parents. Both my parents passed. I lost my dog and I lost two cousins to COVID all within a two year period. So as a psychologist, you understand that. Yeah, that's probably part of that problem. too. Yeah. And and (laughs) And I I know that. And I know that. And I know that's feeding. So you were accurate when you said there's more to this story. So. Right. And see, so so right there, I look at that and I go, um, I, I think there's a great argument that benzos leave us sort of hypersensitive in that limbic system. Right? I agree with you. I would agree. I, I think that's a and I think that's probably a high number of people. And I don't know. I don't know how long that lasts, if that's completely. I, I think that's you know? very, very it's very variable. Um, right. I do think there are people it's quick. And I think there are people who. We don't know why by the research, but there are people who it can last years. Right. You know? And so I look at things through the lens of kind of that limbic system. And I think yeah. if you're someone like myself anyway, and you said you didn't have as much anxiety prior to benzos and you had taken it for your stomach. Well, I had taken it for a neck injury, but I but I had panic and I had trauma. And I like I told you, someone had tried to kill me when I was a kid and domestic violence and alcoholic parents yeah. and like it just this is Jerry Springer, you know, yeah. <laughs> that family should have That's been on Jerry Springer. Yeah, I understand, man. So like I had trauma and I had things that I had healed from and then I had, I thought I was doing, matter of fact, I was doing amazing by the time I got put on benzos. I mean, I had found Zen meditation. I really had rewired my brain. I mean, I was living a spiritual life. I was in college. I was the best I had ever been. I mean, people were coming up to me at work and going, are you, what are you on? And I was like, yeah. I'm on life, man. I am on life. Gotcha. I am here and I'm ready to be here right now you know, whatever it brings. And Benzo's, in a way, after that car accident, stole it from me. It took that joy. Yeah. It took that Zen space. And I remember even trying to meditate, you know, on Benzo, uh, you know, as I was coming off Benzo's and um, not it was easy. not happening. It was not but happening. I, but it's it saved me because unlike you, I actually found the meditation more after my Benzo experience. Um, my my doctor that I found, I went to a couple of doctors trying to find somebody to help me. We've all had that problem to come off. Um, finally, I found one doctor who didn't believe I needed to come off the drugs, but he was willing to work with me and I liked him. I had a previous relationship with him and he was solid. And, and so, but he told me I had to wait six months. And I was talking to this, I was talking to tell this to Dr. Anna Lemke at Stanford on one of our interviews recently. And she thought it was real interesting that he took that approach. But when I came to him, he knew I wasn't mentally stable. Right. And he right. knew tapering from clonopin at that state is not going to go well. Right, And so he made me wait six months. Well, in that six month window, I started meditation. I started yoga. I started exercising. I got outside. I was doing everything to battle this thing. Right, And it started a habit for me. And I wound up meditating through, you know, the first three or four years of my recovery. And it saved me. Now, my yeah. meditation means I, I could reduce my 80 voices in my head down to about 20. <laughs> right, <laughs> You know, right. I, n- I never cleared. I never reached <laughs> that nirvana state. But mm-hmm. I could calm myself some and I could center myself some. And I actually closed most of my podcast with a moment of peace meditation because it's that yes. important. So like you, I think we have found some of the similar tools right. that have helped us get through this. So Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, meditation is why I went into psychology, I think. I yeah. mean, really, initially I had found it and it had changed me so much that I was like, I would, I just wanted to teach meditation. But then I realized nobody's, 
it's not the <laughs> 60s anymore. Nobody's yeah. going to pay you to teach them meditation, you know. But I, but I, yeah. I found like I had found this secret thing. I was like, wow, this thing can change your life. And it can heal trauma. It can rewire your brain. And then yeah. it's it, huge. It, it's amazing, yeah. you know, and um, make you a better person. It just makes you a better, more spiritual, more connected person, I believe. Well, I think it just it slows us down. You know, and I think with people in anxiety, we're just fast. We're fast thinkers. We're fast movers. We're just, life is fast. And I feel like it slows it down a little bit and lets us take a step back and take a different look at life and see it from a different angle, sure. you know, and I yeah. think that helps a lot. So, yeah, it was, sure. it was a lifesaver for me. Um, I totally am with you. I, I, I like, you know, mindfulness, um, CBT, I think is a really great thing. I used some of that when I was going through it. Um, I think there's so many tools and you mentioned this too. And I thought it was interesting. Um, and we can get into a little bit about, but about, you know, in fact, like maybe we should just tackle it, but you mentioned about bind right? and you've talked about this on your podcast. And I think there might be some misperception mm -hmm. and I, and I think we might be able to talk about it. And I think we're probably going to be more understanding on this than you might imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, but you had mentioned about bind. So I know you had a perception about it and you've heard it about it. Um, right. and I can tell you all the background because I'm part of the team that developed it. So, um, I'm happy to give you some background and tell you kind of our focus, but I think one of the things that you're afraid of, or not afraid of, but we're leery of about it is valid. And I have some of the same concerns. That's why I think we're probably going to be somewhat on the same page. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jennifer Swantowski? Yeah, I do. Too. Right. So she's awesome. She's a good friend of mine. And she yeah. was the first that sort of brought it to me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like, in fact, we're, we're trying to schedule her to be on my podcast pretty soon. So I've been trying to set that one up too. So yeah, it's funny. Me you too. Her name. Jennifer, yeah. you better get on my <laughs> podcast first. You hear me? Where is the camera? I don't mind if you want to do <laughs> oh, only if you come to be on mine and then we can have hers on you. We'll figure she's, this all out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She's too busy. She said no. Uh but we had a you know, I was like, where is this bind coming from? And 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 well, what what was happening was I kept hitting, getting clients that would come to me and they would yeah. book a session. And right out front they would say something like, I don't know why I booked, you know, I'm talking to you. I mean, nobody can help me. I got bind or bend. Yeah. And I was like, What? Yeah, I've got this. This it's just perm it's like a permanent damage thing and there's no treating it and there's nothing that you can do. That's what they were saying. And I go, I don't where is this coming from? And that's from? and that's a misinterpretation. And but I understand why people are using it as that interpretation. So yeah. So yeah. I would dive deep. So first my experience with this was sort of fighting uh -huh. all the the boogeyman nature of it, so to speak, with people. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know where this is coming from. Is it I literally did not know where it was coming yeah, from. I can give you all the background. So I'm happy to provide <clears throat> that for you. Yeah. So I, I you know, I was you know, basically, I would dive in because I was looking, at, you know, at hard at their explanation, mm -hmm. and then I would find things like, well, I think, you know, in one case, it was like, well, I think you're talking about a paradoxical effect, and it, I truly believe that's what they're talking about. In another yeah. case, it was, well, you're just talking about benzo withdrawal. Well, no, I have exactly. this buzzing and this, yeah, that's benzo withdrawal, but I can't sleep. Yeah. Yep, that's benzo withdrawal. You know, I mean, I think it was almost like they couldn't come to terms, which is a lot of my clients that initially, right? Especially the new ones that don't know a lot about it. They just cannot believe that all of this is benzos. I'm like, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, not benzos. Exactly. It's it's the limbic system reacting to benzos. It's, and it's, it's, a lot it's of the, yeah, it's it's the what's left behind, <laughs> you know, the right. damage of benzos. And I'm not saying at all it's permanent. I'm saying this is what's happened. Mm -hmm. And now, um, yeah, just, just a little quick background. Um, Bind came up from, a, it was a Delphi study through several different, we had about, two dozen or so physicians, medical professionals, lived experience working through the study sponsored by the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. Um, I was part of the survey research team. So we were part of the team that was doing this. So um, the third paper from that research team, we have two published. The third one coming out will actually officially introduce the term bind. Um, that one's currently in submission. Okay. But the first two survey papers are already out and those have been published in medical literature. Um, but anyway, the primary purpose was only to, there were so many terms for the protracted state. We were trying to simplify it. Right. There's post-acute withdrawal. There's protracted withdrawal. There's benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. There was benzo brain injury. There was, and the problem was right. people were telling their physicians, they were using, everything was different and they weren't associating it to the same condition. Right. We weren't necessarily trying to create a new condition. We were trying to find one term. Mm -hmm. that maybe we can get the doctors to agree on and the patients to agree on and say, this is the condition. So that right. was really the goal behind BIND. The name came through several iterations. It was run through all these different people on, on the on the panels. Um, and, and one of the things, what you mentioned was disorder was even considered. 
But one of the reasons we avoided disorder and went with dysfunction is we don't believe it's necessarily a disorder. It wasn't, we were trying to avoid the permanence of the term. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. This was never intended to say, hey, this is a permanent condition. There's nothing you can do about it. And that is right. not our goal. Right. Okay. What we noticed in this survey, and this was the benzodiazepine survey of 2018, 2019, and it had 1,200 um, respondents on it. So it was the largest benzodiazepine survey that's been accomplished in the U.S. Um, on that survey, what we saw were these di two different groups of symptomatology. Okay. The first one was typical withdrawal. And right. we see this with other drugs like opioids and um, all these other ones that have having withdrawal. And that would be hallucinations, um, body tremors. Um, seizures. And those usually happened quickly within the first month. And there was that group, but then there was this protracted ones that seemed to last for months and years. And it was more anxiety, nervousness. Um, it was more tiredness. It was um, cognitive dysfunction, um, some ecosesia, some other things thrown in there, but these were the ones that were lasting longer. And we saw this difference and this wasn't common in any of the other drugs with the exception of alcohol. And we started to see the similarities, not, not that that hadn't already been reported on the literature, it had been, but we started to see more of the similarities between alcohol and benzodiazepines. And as you probably know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crossover since they affect sure. a lot of the same receptors. So anyway, we were seeing this, what might be, we, we presumed it might be neurotoxicity or neuroadaptation, but again, that's just a guess. And that's stated in the paper that it's a guess. Now, so the idea is that we came up with this term, we're suggesting this term for the medical literature, so we have a term for what we're going through, okay, that people can bring to doctors and stuff like that. Now, to get to your point, um, the last thing we want to do is to say, anybody saying, hey, I have binds, there's nothing I can do about it. And right, that is right. never the goal of what we're doing. Um, right. Our goal is only to give a common term that everybody can use for this protracted state of withdrawal that may be due to neurological changes in the body, right. not suggesting they're permanent, just right, saying right. some changes that can take time to heal through right. homeostasis and all the other processes. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if that helps clarify, but that may be no, it a does. brief background of bind. Okay. No, and I appreciate that. And, and Jennifer uh, said something similar to that. Okay. And so she kind of, uh, kind of made it make sense for me. And she said, look, it's almost like when all the other stuff doesn't apply, when it's not a yeah. paradoxical effect, when it isn't exactly. simply protracted or when, when it's it not return of the original condition, when, yeah, all these kinds of things. Now we have this condition that's lingering and yeah, that we can't find another reason for, which by the way, I said, Oh, okay. I I'm with you. Okay. There's, yeah. It's not like I'm a contrary. No, I'm for, with from you. What I've heard from you, you actually seem to be on board with that too. I yeah. think it was, it was only semantics about, is it, it actually neurological? Is it maybe more psychological? Might it be some other things? And I heard some of that on your podcast. And I think those are valid questions. And yeah. I think, I think yeah. it is more than one thing. That's right, just it. Right. It's like, I think, you know, we are still, there's still 10 times more things about benzodiazepine dependence that we don't know than we know. Right, right, right. You know? And yeah. so we're all still trying to figure this out. And I'll Absolutely. admit from us, it's like, and you have far more clinical experience and far more, you know, education experience than I do. I don't have any psychological or medical background. Um, so another yeah. thing I ever say is medical advice. It's always just a guy that's been through it with lived experience, who's been working with other individuals going through it on a kind right. of coaching basis as you are doing um, sure. and has learned from them. But no, I don't have the clinical background to say this is what the problem is. I, it's just not my background. Yeah. I mean, even with me, I can't say that either. I think it'd be, no. it'd be kind of foolish just pro to proclaim something, um, you know, Hearing you and Jennifer talk about it, like I said, I'm on board with it. I go, okay, great. That makes sense. My pushback was more yeah. about everybody else. It was everyone else. you know. So even as you were going through and explaining that, I'm thinking that is so vastly different from a dozen other reports from my clients. Because I would ask them, what do you mean yeah. by that? And I remember we had conversations like, well, they don't understand dependence and addiction. And you never even mentioned that. I'm like, that's not even... No. What... Bend is not a... a uh, uh, you know, physical dependence is probably a factor in it but it's not addiction it's not addiction know? but they said we yeah. want to we want to remove because it's too it's too fuzzy and that's why i go well listen you know is it better to create new words that the medical fields are going to push back against and make us look all the sure. more crazy or do we just fight the good fight for the words that do exist like doctors do know the difference between dependence and med and, and addiction right absolutely like absolutely. you you can be dependent on your heart medication you don't right. become an, an addict on it 
So I was like, I would rather fight the fight where it's, you know, but then again, as you're saying all this, that's not what Ben was intended to be necessarily. So it was just a lot of people that I think heard pieces of things and exactly. then almost redefined yeah. them. You know what I mean? And the fact that you brought this up and the fact that people brought it up to you is exactly what we need to hear. Mm -hmm. If our message is getting out there and it's not being interpreted correctly, I want to know. I mean, right. I want to know so that maybe we can clarify things like we're doing right now so we can understand right. better. And I, you know, I, that's why your your podcast didn't bother me at all, because I want pushback. Right. I mean, we're never going to learn more about this condition if people don't challenge us, if people don't push back, if the doctors don't put, you know, and right. I sit in these rooms with these doctors all the time on research teams and stuff. And I'm always that guy in the corner going, yeah, I don't really know all the words you just said, but I'm going to look right. them up afterwards because right. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> but I bring the lived experience. And actually, I'm also the data analysis because I used to be a data programmer. So I bring that okay. talent to the research teams. Okay. Um, and I'll admit that open part of the door. That's why I'm involved is I'm mm -hmm. the data guy. Um, wow. But also they look to me because of my experience working with people like on a coaching basis is you and I have started to develop in our brains, you know, this, this kind of model. Right. And I, I don't want to say typicals because there is no typical benzo patient, um, but this model of commonalities mm -hmm. and trends that we've seen, you know, and I'm sure you probably agree with that, but it's, it's right. you know, I think we start to develop that and that's useful, you know, and that's sure. a useful knowledge base that we have that can help researchers and can help Absolutely. people like that. And people like you are the people we need more involved because you also bring a different take to it. And I right. always welcome that different take and different input. Right, right, um, right. Yeah, I didn't want to be labeled a contrarian, you know, of the, oh, or, no. or, or yeah. you know, or counterculture guy of the Benzo community. But I, but I, my pushback was there was, and I had a great conversation with Jennifer and she agreed just yeah. like you did. I said, Jennifer, there's a lot of people using it wrong and they're using it to justify things you know they're basically their limbic system is jumping on it and and using it as another boogeyman and it's scaring and the hell out of them that's true yeah. and they're also saying things like you know like i said initially uh why, i don't know why i'm talking no, nobody can do anything for me there's nothing yeah. you can do therapies no, don't bind, work bind is protracted withdrawal that's really what it is it's not something right. new it's not something we've created it's not something we suddenly discovered what right. we discovered was people's experiences and that there's some patterns but right. we haven't discovered some new condition. Right. We're just people? saying, hey, yeah, here's the name <laughs> for what we already knew. Good. We're just trying to further create some terminology and clarif clarify things. That's Love all it. we're yeah, trying to I'm do. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Good. People hear that. <laughs> so I, I, I hope that makes sense. You know? I would be happy. Any kind of pushback, any kind of questions, I am always open to. I'm always hoping to come back here and talking more about it. Um, and if it isn't the right thing, you know, we'll go a different direction. We want to do what's right and what's the best thing for us to be working sure. on. So. Yeah, I'd like to dive deeper into it myself. I think it's probably more about not less. It's less to do with you guys uh, dropping the ball or misrepresenting it. And I think it has a lot more to do with what we were talking about earlier. The whole reason why well, one of the reasons why we're talking today, which is people clinging to something and then yeah. running with it. You know, it's, exactly. it's, it's all amygdala. It's all, you know, that, that limbic system is is addicted to trauma it's addicted to fear and so it's all it's going to hear so if i say 99.9 .9 of people are going to heal they'll go what about that point that's what you're going to cling to it's like you why did he you. say that i, I get i've gotten letters letters i get that all the time pages. too yeah and that's why we have to constantly say look you know you know i always say that i'm the exception i am by far the exception of the average benzo patient Sure. I'm rare. Right. You know, I still have protected yeah. withdrawal at eight years. I still have some problems, you know, yeah. and and I know I'm the rare one. And so I always try right. to make sure I mention that because I don't want people to use me as an example of what you're going to become. Yeah. Because the odds of that are extremely. <laughs> slim, right. You know. So, so let's talk about that for a moment, yeah. too, because now my take on that was not having. And like I said, uh, I was not coming at you sideways or any of that. That was not my intention. My intention was to calm nerves and also right. just to show people. Hey, look, guys, it's not a situation that I've heard of where you can be eight years off thriving and then and then on, suddenly on a Tuesday, you're back in hell. I, I don't think it's how it works. Now, I would make the argument that benzos leaves us with a, a hypersensitivity and that, that, that stress centering part of the brain. Not all that different in some sense of people with trauma. It leaves us with trauma. So my vision for benzos is... Basically, I've been toying with this visually. I'm a visual person, a visual artist. Uh, a picture like a seven-headed beast, you know, a, a dragon yeah. with seven heads. And the body is chemical benzo withdrawal. 
but the manifestations, and, and this is where I think some people get me wrong because they think Dave's is just saying that Benzo creates all these other things. And I'm like, no, no, these things are part of it. You know, health anxiety, anxiety is a direct withdrawal symptom, right? Trauma, yes, absolutely, non sleeping, number one, right? Yeah, depression, hypersensibility, you know, all these things. We go down the list, there's a horrendous list. And then as those things keep going on and on, mm-hmm. now anxiety has become panic and panic has become agoraphobia. And I tell people, once, once the, the point of your limbic system, right? So, so I look at GABA like being the, the myelination or the clothing that surrounds the limbic system, right? It's the protective shield. And it's what we call okay. it and cradle that limbic system. You take that down. I'm like, the shields are down, man. This yeah. part of the brain that is so susceptible to trauma and 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 it's like an elephant it doesn't forget i say the limbic yeah. system remembers every, every bad thing that you have forgotten or you think you forgot it remembers and that's its job yeah. is to protect us to keep you know it remembers everything you have a panic right. attack on a bridge and remember it 20 years later you know because yeah. the bridge might have been dangerous you know so uh i think benzos what it does is it 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 manifests but I don't look at them as like distinctly different things necessarily you know i just think it's this is i you know I was just telling Jennifer this. I said, I think people think that I downplay benzos when in real when in reality, I think benzos are much more horrible than yeah. than what meets the eye. It's not just this chemical thing. Right. It's it's the anxiety growing and growing and stress growing and growing and depression leads to DPDR and SI and agoraphobia. And yeah, that's why I said I don't think we're that far apart because um I do believe there's ner- there is central nervous system damage. There's even some peripheral nervous system damage to mitochondria and other factors that we've seen. Mm-hmm. But that is never meant to say that any of this damage is permanent. You know, this is right, damage right. that the body does. Homeostasis is amazing. Our bodies are incredibly powerful. We right. heal from the worst stuff that happens to us. Yeah. Our bodies recover. And so I, I don't I never mean to say that this is some permanent condition. It's not. There has been some, I don't want to say damage, there's been some alterations to our nervous system, okay? Whether it's GABA-A receptors, which we believe is a factor, downregulation, but other factors too. Right. But is is there also maybe PTSD on top of there? Is there also maybe, like you mentioned, some health anxiety? Is there also, and don't, do these all feed each other? Absolutely. It is not just the nervous system damage. Right, that's a right. factor and that's an element. So I, yeah, a lot of what you said, I, I agreed with. It was like, right. no, I, there is so many different levels. It, the thing that brought this was my current, my recent wave. Okay. Right. And you mentioned something that I really liked what you said. And I think it was a terminology thing that I should correct. Um, I was calling it a setback. You thought what I went through was a flare up. And I actually right. think that's a better term because oh, cool. I do not. And I, this is where I think there was the misunderstanding I do not believe I have taken a huge step back in my recovery. Right, right. I think I use the word setback as meaning I took a step back. <laughs> right. Is what I was more referring to. And that I had a big wave of symptoms. Were there other causes of this? Absolutely. Right, right. Okay. And you mentioned it too. You mentioned COVID. It's like, I believe 100% that this is COVID and benzodiazepines and probably some other emotional factors I'm going through. God, you they said you said you lost four. Four or What's five that? people? You said you lost like four or five people in two years? Yeah. In the past in the past two years, um, I was taking care of my parents in Kansas City. And I drove back and forth about 23 times between Denver and Kansas City. It's a 10-hour drive each way wow. um, to handle their care. They both passed on at the later part of that time. I also had just lost my dog. And during that was also COVID. And of course, COVID makes taking care of elderly people extremely difficult because I couldn't see them. We couldn't help them half the time. Um, but also I lost two cousins to COVID during that time. So I yeah. had, I've had, i had a lot. And I know that's in me right now. Right. And right. I know I still haven't processed most of that. Right. So is that a factor? Absolutely. How the hell could it not be? Right. Yeah. But it's so not, I, have, yeah. It's, I hear what you're saying is it's not. And, and, and nor was I saying. Uh, it's not benzos. It's got to be all these external things. That wasn't what I was saying. No, and I, I was saying that from you. Yeah. Uh, someone who's been through a lot of trauma, who's had, who's gone through hell, who is probably got a hypersensitized limbic system still. Yeah. Even if you just want to make the argument exactly. of exactly tied exactly. to all this other stuff, and then you lose that. I didn't even know about all that loss. I mean, someone had said like yeah. you were going through some things. I don't remember right? people giving me little tidbits, but and then just what you shared, I was like, man, there's a lot of stress on this guy's plate. Yeah. And so instead of, so my message to people was don't think about setbacks. If you, if you look at something like eight years later, um, 
and stress and stress. And, and, and it's not just stress. You're talking about real grief. You're talking about like in losing a parent, you know, I mean, outside of losing like a child yeah. is it's, it's like it affects you almost on a DNA level, man. I mean, these is our, these are our family, you know, this is like, this is so deep. So the grief and everything you're going through, the drive in 10 hours alone would have, I mean, the stress on that alone would have yeah. been horrendous for a lot of people. So I looked at it like, here's someone with a hyper sensitized nervous system who's went through hell, trauma, who's doing this work, which I don't think people understand how hard this work is, right. you know, that, that right. what it does, the stress, and it's almost like reliving a trauma over and over again, in a sense, to everybody <laughs> that you're dealing with. And so I thought it was more, I said, that, that was my argument, that maybe it's a flare up, maybe stress... Rose and I, rose. I actually like your term. I mean, it's a wave. It, honestly, it's just a, right. it's a wave of symptoms, but it's not all caused by benzos. And right. I never meant to, to insinuate it was. Um, it's. Yeah. I, I think it's probably from what I read about COVID and benzos. Some of their effects overlap. Yeah. So if if you like you said, my system's hypersensitive right now. Right. Has it gotten better? Absolutely. I have made so right. much progress in the eight years. I am nothing like I was. And no, I am not back to square one in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I had some major things. I've had COVID, I believe, three times. Um, the first time was in 2019, so we weren't testing. Um, the last time I tested positive. So this one in December, I tested positive early December. Um but that alone creates some neurological issues. It also yeah. creates fatigue. It creates, you know, ongoing issues. And so I had that. I was still dealing with the grief. I'm still right. dealing with the stress of my job and everything, all the stuff right. I'm doing here. And, you know, all the other stuff. So, yes, I agree. It's hypersensitivity that's still lingering from a protracted state of right. benzo withdrawal combined with these other factors that are feeding me. So right. I think you and I were probably 99% in agreement. Right. I don't think on. we disagree yeah. on any of that. Right. But, but I think some people heard it differently and that's and why I think I would... they did. And that's why it's good for us to get back on here and yeah. clarify from both sides and to say, right. look, I didn't take offense at all from what you said, because what you said was accurate. Right, um, I didn't right. find any fault with your logic. I really didn't. Right. Um, you mentioned health anxiety might be a factor mm -hmm. and I get that. And trust me, that's been a factor in my past. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's the factor now only because I've dealt with that so many times. I know what it's like. Um, right. Right. And trust me, I do have health anxiety sometimes. This one I think is more the grief, the COVID right. tied in with it. Um, right. but I totally get where you're coming from with the health anxiety because that has been a factor in my healing. Sure, and sure. I know what it's like and I faced that before. So hey, by the way, I wasn't diagnosing anything. No, you weren't. I just you heard weren't. a bunch of variables and I said, Well, yeah. this or that or this it or that. It was a good guess. I, I would know. have guessed the same thing if it was somebody calling into me. I would have said, you know, that maybe right. it's an ongoing health anxiety issue. Yeah. You know. So, so I wanted to clear the air and I wanted to get that out there. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do that. And, no, I, yeah, I appreciate it too. And because, honestly, by what, what it did for me was it got me to go over and listen to your podcast and listen to you talk and listen to what you do. And I kind of became a fan. I oh, mean, man, that's cool. You Thanks. and I have similar low key approaches. Yeah. You know, like right now when I'm an interview, I, my voice is up a little bit. I talk a little faster when I'm on my podcast. I more do this. And I'm right. talking about at this pace, Very you know, and so people who listen to me in the podcast, this is the voice you hear most of the time Yeah, because I'm more calm and I'm relaxed and I go to my baritone voice. Right. right. When somebody's asking me questions, I go up here and I go, oh, yeah, well, this is what I do. This is, you know, <laughs> so those are the right. two me's you can kind of yep. understand, but, but we have, I think a similar style, a mm -hmm. similar approach. And I don't, didn't find anything that I really disagree with you pretty much on what you were saying. Yeah. So thank you. I thought yeah. you were very solid. And your background in psychology, I think, is what makes you so good at what you do. It's a right. background I don't have. I'm still right. learning from day one on some of this stuff. But you have insight that I don't have. And God, I welcome that. I mean, I think that's very helpful. Yeah, so, it is. It is. It do, And it does shape things differently. I do really, yeah. truly believe it because you do look at mental illness in a different light, right? It, right. It, it, and it's hard to understand it until you've, I think, experienced gone down that rabbit hole so much and you start to see the overlaps of things so you know one thing I, one piece that i wanted to cover was the idea okay. that a setback wasn't what you were saying wasn't what they were hearing which was here's a guy that was healed eight years later and then one day boom a, a million receptors destroyed all over again and i was like no. that's not what and he's I saying i did not mean to yeah exactly he's not what he's and saying so, and if you're hearing that you're not understanding and it the probably situation. was me not clarifying it very well i do that sometimes in the podcast and i make mistakes like everybody <clears> and i'll <throat> go back and correct it and clean it up 
but I do get it because sometimes what I say is misinterpreted or I say the wrong thing. And that's just yeah. the nature of what we do here. I mean, is yeah, yeah, we sometimes don't get our message out clearly like we intended to, you know. Absolutely. Well, I, I really didn't think you said anything that okay. triggering or when I heard it, I was like, What's there? But again, everybody I, I get it. Know. I mean, if I look back to the way we were at the beginning or in, in the more extreme states, yeah, some of the, what I said probably could be triggering. I, right, I get right. that. And I see it. I don't yeah, I think it's I think it's valid. I don't think what people are complaining about is not valid. It's just I don't think we could do what we can't what we do without occasionally being triggering. It's just the nature of what we do. I, I trigger people all the you time. Know? Yeah. Yeah. It I happens. And we, yeah. Um, you know, I do think uh Benzo's left me a bit more sensitive, but I can't but you can't it's hard for me to say that because I don't know what parallel Dave would be who and didn't you know what i mean yeah. i don't know i don't know yeah. in some ways i think it made me more resilient and stronger it definitely lit a fire under under yeah. me and made me approach my mental health in a whole new more serious way which had a lot of benefits but you know i look back at all the trauma i had and i i i, I realize now i have to really manage my stress i really do you know i agree and this is doing this coaching you know i almost walked away from it like the first year i started doing it because I just stopped sleeping. I was having bad dreams. And I realized, you know, uh, like this is like really digging open an old wound here. I mean, how many people's stories can you hear? And, you know, as soon as I started doing this, I worked with someone, got really close to her, and then she took her life. And I, I almost I, said, I, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm going to leave, not doing this. I didn't, you know, I don't want to hurt people. I can't, you know, and I don't think I, she didn't do it because of me. You know what I mean? But just that feeling of failing no, I've, someone. I've lost several. You know, I, I, I too, I, the problem is we don't probably know all the people we lose right? because for me, it's like they're writing into me from the podcast and they just stop right. writing. Well, I don't know. Have they gotten better? Right. Have they moved on or are they no longer there? And I don't know most of the time, unless a family member reaches out to me to say something I often don't know. Yeah. You know, but I've yeah. lost some people close to me um, who I've known for a while who did take their own life through in this right. process. Um, yeah. And suicidality is a significant factor of what this is. Now, I'm not trying to say yeah. that to scare anybody. I'm not trying to say right. that, you know, but it is something that we need to watch out for and treat properly because, you know, this is a factor and it's real and it can happen. 100%. And it was that person's death that I was close to that made me want to make that Benzo film that really, I mean, I wanted to do it, but yeah. it, it made it like, I have to do this now. I have to. And, and, yeah, I'm very curious. I saw the clip on your website, so I'm now very curious to see. Is, is it a short film? You said, how, "What's the no?" It's a it? feature. It's an hour. Oh, it's and a half. feature. Yeah, it's said a, short somewhere in one of the things. I it was It started reading, so. as a short. Yeah, okay, I did. That's why. And that's then why. it just kept growing. And I think it was like the first or second day of shooting. Okay. You know, I went through it all like a, a heavy audition process. I mean, we had conversation. The lead actress, she sort of said to me, "You know, like this is. I'm very sensitive to this topic of just mental health in general." She yeah. says, I want to do it, but I don't know if I can because I don't want to. Get... She's such a good actress. And, you know, when you're a really good actor, I used to think when I heard these people like, you know, when I did this character, it, would, it messed me up. And I thought, what? Is... Yeah. You're just pretending, you know, snap out of it. But no, that's not the case. A really no, good actor. No, it doesn't work. Yeah. No. they. I, they... I, I, I wrote a few and produced a few indies, in more indie features. And I did one in Colorado a while back. And it was also had involved mental health. And okay. you're right. I mean, it's like it's many actors get completely into the subject. Yeah. And it's very difficult. And right. Um, so yeah, with with our both our backgrounds in film, it's so funny that uh, that trajectory that we both have music and film and oh, and the great. same thing. Yeah. It's it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I was um I was more a screenwriter. I taught screenwriting at um University of Colorado Denver uh for a while and I was a screenwriter and then I was um on the advisory board of the Vale Film Festival for 10 years. Mm. So I was doing film for a while. That was my database career. And then there was my film career. <laughs> oh, and then it was my Benzo career, which started when I started coming off the drugs. So, what, so were you directing career. or just, just writing? Or no, what, I'm what mostly a writer. Um, I, I co-produced that feature. I've co-produced a few, um, yeah. but I'm not a director by far. And I'm not an actor. I was a writer. Um, right. I always have been a screenwriter. And I, 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 my true love was teaching the screenwriting. I loved teaching. So I would teach the film circuit at right. different conferences and festivals. And I would go around and do some teaching. And That's interesting. You know. So yeah. yeah, it was it was a passion. So Couple how did you writers. get into it? Yeah, I yeah, you know, it's interesting because I went to school for um, uh, I was pre med at one point. You know, went to be a doctor. I, I was pre med starting out, ah. and then I got a degree in mass communications ah. with film studies. Oh, in oh the end. boy, <laughs> what a couple of dummies! <laughs> I know. It'd be in our house in Malibu somewhere right now. Uh, I think so, man. Brothers from <laughs> different mothers. I think we just right. figured this out. So. <laughs> yeah. 
I uh, yeah, I got close. I almost went to psychiatry, and the whoo, boy, that that no, no, nope. looked at that too. I had uh, five five declared majors in college, mm-hmm. and I finally re- realized my actual career is nomadic. Yeah, I'm just what, a nomad. That's what was my your career. Majors? Um, I psychology was one. Um, I was music. Of course, I was mm-hmm. studying my my scholarship was on music, so I was studying at their percussion group there. Um, so music, psychology, pre med. So I was chemistry starting out. Great. Right. Um, and then I was also God. I'm trying to remember all five of them. I remember because there, there were five, and I'm trying to remember what they all were. Yeah. Um, eventually, it was mass communications. That was my final degree with film studies. Um, and there was another one in there somewhere. I don't remember what it was. I just remember the saying because I used to say out of college I had five degree and yeah. I can't remember one of them. We're so getting old. The, it's yeah, too far. there's, there's it's the too... brain. Yeah, I know I always <laughs> want to say benzo brain, but the truth is, most of this could just be age. <laughs> so that's what I'm realized, saying. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of factors. I agree with you. I think benzo I is. Knows. I definitely have some neurological issues from and cognitive issues are ongoing. I know I do, but yeah. do I know how much of it is benzos and how much is age and how much might be COVID and how much right, might right. be? No, I don't know. And I yeah. can't honestly say, you know, what's the factors here. So, and I, I know that. Yeah. I think we have the same attitude about it. Like I'm kind of like enough that it's on the table for me, but it's oh, yeah. not something that I push enough to say, this is what's happening. Cause I'm like, I don't know. Man. Yeah. Truth be told. Yeah. Be- before, older, this, yeah before the recent flare up, my <clears throat> average ongoing symptoms were, I still have facial paresthesia, but it's spiders in the face. But my God, I've gotten used to it. And I forgot it's there most of the time. I have tinnitus. Right. And with yeah. this recent wave, my pulsatile tinnitus came back pretty strong. I went and got my hearing checked and all that kind of stuff, but it came back pretty strong. But still some tinnitus. You know, I still have some cognitive dysfunction, um, right. especially anxiety triggered cognitive dysfunction, which makes it difficult for me to go back to IT. Mm-hmm. But I probably really could if I if I if I wanted to try. Um, right. but I would say I'm 85, 90%, but again, right. I'm an exception. Um, I took fluoroquinolones when I was, um, when right. I was, um, tapering, didn't think to look in the Ashen Magnum, right. didn't right. think to look it up. I was prescribed it for prostatitis, prostatitis, um, which was misdiagnosed because it was pelvic, pelvic floor dysfunction, which you mentioned, I think on your show. Right. And that's when I started to see the pelvic floor dysfunction uh-huh. tie in with benzodiazepine dependence. And now I still have some urinary issues based off of all that. Right. But they prescribed me fluoroquinolones. I just took it. And as you know, those are black box warnings by themselves, even without going through taper. So that creates neuropathy. That can't help my recovery. (laughs) Right, right. You know, I updosed during my... So I did a lot of things, and there's a lot of things. I'm also ADHD. Mm. You know, so there are always extenuating factors that feed to my condition. I cannot say that I'm still having problems just based on benzos. Right, right. I hear you. Yeah. Um, let me go back to that film thing sure. a bit. Now, um, I was actually, so I was an artist since I was young. You yeah. Know, and like actually, I said, I, I'm trying to think of which take we talked about that because I don't think we took it in this third take. So, no. no. <laughs> so I, I, I was I was telling David earlier that um, I went online and saw some of his graphite art sketch, sketches and they were, I was really impressed. I was blown away by by your talent in that area. That was really cool. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, I, I always had a, like an aptitude and then i did mm-hmm. you know one day i reached out i was doing I, I lived out in the woods my wolf and kind of a zen guy out there and yeah. i was making these very abstract art pieces of you know very surreal i, I was calling them hyper surrealism mm-hmm. and i remember uh, it was on May, myspace back in those days and i reached out I feel so old now back in those days <laughs> yeah, I do that. I say that a lot these days. <laughs> Back in those days, you yeah. might have heard about MySpace. And uh, yeah. I reached out to um, uh, Chet Czar, who was this uh, brilliant artist, who is a brilliant artist. And he was also an artist for the band Tool. And he did a bunch of uh, like their videos and a lot of art mm-hmm. stuff. And I just happened to write him and I said, hey, I really admire you and your work. And then he wrote back and he's like, hey, I like your work. And I was like, what? This guy's you know, this guy's like famous and he's, Isn't that he's weird? brilliant, yeah. you know? And so it, it started a friendship and we started talking back and forth and he said, you know, you could do really well in LA. And I'm over here in the middle of nowhere, Florida. And I'm yeah. like, LA, I'm like a 20 year old kid, you know? And he's like, I know. yeah, he said, you should, uh, you should uh, reach out to so-and-so at this gallery called Cannibal Flower, which is like this big gallery. And it, I wrote him and next thing I know, the guy's like, you're in. Wow, next thing I know, cool. I'm up. Yeah, I took all the money I had. We, we flew to LA. And next thing I knew, you know, I was downtown Los Angeles at a five star gallery, 
you know, mm-hmm. doing my first art show at like, tw- I think I was probably 20, 22 years old, something like that. And I was just blown away. You know, it was, it was crazy. And uh, that opened the doors. And then I chased the art career for years and, and actually getting um, on, you know, coming off of Benzos and that whole ride destroyed it. I mean, it scared the hell out of me because yeah, for two years I could not create nothing. I mean, yeah. I thought it was gone. I thought I was, I was like, wow. I mean, imagine spending your whole life master, mastering roofing or something, and then you get sick and you forget how to lay exactly. roof again. You know, yeah. it's like, this is crazy. I, 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 my art career is gone. And I didn't, I mean, that really bottomed me out because I didn't, I only, that's all I ever wanted to be was an artist. But that's not even fair to say that. I think you're, you're a creative guy, right? So it's just, yeah. It's like saying, did you want to have red hair or, or black hair yeah. or brown hair? It's like, that's just what I did. It's what I was. It's what I knew. So to suddenly not have that, it was very strange. And I didn't know if it was going to yeah, come Yeah, trust back. me. I, did, I didn't choose red hair. It just came with the package. <laughs> right. And I don't think I chose art. I didn't choose yeah, music. Know. <laughs> you know, it just is a, a, an obsession or something. I don't know what it was. Well, and it's interesting because you're right about the, the career thing. Because it's like, I was I was IT for a long time, did database development for 25 years. And then I went into, into screenwriting, which was my original degree out of college but i went back into that and did that for about 10 but yeah when i got you know started going through the condition i had to drop the screen the whole screen career i couldn't write i couldn't do anything like um and then i actually went back and did some database contracts occasionally when i was starting my taper Mm -hmm. but even those by the time i dropped off my last dose of clonopin and went up going into acute withdrawal i couldn't do that anymore so then i was out of work for a long time and i started writing the book and i started doing this and this is what i've been doing since um You know, and I still do data work on that research team. So I still do some database work, which is nice. I keep my fingers in it, but I only do it occasionally. Most of the work on those research teams, we're just talking about the writing and and the methodologies and stuff like that. So, yeah, but it it gave me a new career. And you were talking about that, too. It's like this is a new career. It is far more meaningful than any career I've had with the possible exception of music at the time. You know, I think music was was a true love of mine. So it may be equal to music. But right. I, I, yeah, I, I found a new career. I'm very, I'm not happy it happened to me, but I'm happy with the changes that have happened in my life. Right. Kind of what and you it, were saying. Yeah. yeah. It's a huge, me- uh, huge part of my message too, is, is there's a silver lining here. There so is, there really is. Right. Yeah. Like you don't have to just look at this, like, this is the thing that made me weird or no. broke me and damaged me. And I'm never going to be, it's like work hard. Uh, you know, be smart, approach your recovery smart. And I mean, that's a big piece of my philosophy yeah. is that we can, you know, I, I tell people if you, I, I have my own recovery program that's sort of based on uh-huh. all the things that worked for me uh, okay. initially, you know, things like exercise, exposure, all this stuff. But the the caveat is like, you know, when I, I got so devastated on this thing, I, I, I didn't like, I woke up on a Tuesday and went jogging like Rocky, you know, yeah. I started by walking to the mailbox and back. Exactly. You, you know start what I mean? Small. It, it, you yep. start so small. I'd walk to the mailbox yeah. one time and, and I would be wiped out and I would come home. Yeah. I would come back to the, the bedroom and just lay there and have panic attacks and be like, I can't do this. And the next day I did it again. And now I was learning at the time I had gotten into my clinical psych program and I was just doing a classes online, you know, and it was just mm-hmm. like, it was very dabbing, you know, just tipping my foot into the water, so to speak. You know, a lot of people go, how did you, you know, how did you manage with everything going on? I was like, well, the same way that you guys are all geniuses on benzos too, right? Like every client I have yeah. has a pre- PhD in benzos, man. They know every damn it's thing by, about by, it. It's by demand, you know, it's, I mean, by requirement. It's like, you right. don't really have a choice. You have to educate yeah. yourself on. And that's yeah. the number one thing. Yeah, I say that a lot of times on mine. It's like one of the steps you have to do is educate yourself. You need to learn about these. You need to figure right. out the information and you need to disseminate. There's not all good information out there. That's right. But you can define what works for you. Exactly. And, yeah. Yep. And a lot of trial and error, a lot of mm-hmm. trial and error. I mean, that's just, that's the process we all got to go through. I mean, I think the one axiom that I stick by that stands true more than anything else is everybody's experience. And this is different, you know? Yeah. There are commonalities. Yeah. There are things we see that we can see trends, yeah. but Everybody seems to have some different symptoms. Everybody seems to have them last a little bit different longer. Plus, this everybody right. has different effects in their life that are affecting their mental state. Oh, yeah. And what's going on. So, right. Resources and all of that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, for me, I put together a program, which was, you know, the idea was gradually. And this is what I tell people. I say, look, during Benzo withdrawal, if you do everything I'm telling you or advising you to do anyway, um, 
and again, I, I didn't create this. This wasn't me. I just extrapolated a bunch of really good things from a lot of different. I, I was almost That's like the a, best a, way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of like a neo Renaissance guy in a sense where I had like, oh, I had all this understanding and knowledge and nutrition and exercise and mm -hmm. uh, Zen meditation and clinical psych and DBT and CBT and, you know, ACT and all the other uh, acronyms. <laughs> and I just started, you know, finding what worked and, you know, like uh, Bruce Lee's old philosophy. He said, uh, Use what is useful, reject what is useless, you know. So I just sort of this work, this don't. And and so I never wanted, you know, when I first came out and kind of was on the scene, people said, like, he's trying to tell people to do all this. I said, no, no. What I'm saying is if you put together a recovery program, if you're really smart at it and you start really small, and I, and I tell my story and I say, I started by walking to the mailbox and back. I started by curling pink dumbbells that were 2.5 pounds, mm -hmm. right? If that isn't, you know, humbling, <laughs> right? Like, that's not, that's what I'm saying. I 2.5 yeah. pounds. I curled it five times. I put it down and I was spent for the day. But the next day I did it again. The next day and over a period of several months, it became like my little Rocky montage. And suddenly walking to the mailbox and back became a little easier. Curling came a little bit easier. Yeah. Adding 10, 15, 20, 50 steps a day or a week started to, you, you build started on to it build. You, you started build. to build, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so I, that's what I worked to do was put up a program that I that I really believed in that I really think saved me because I was sinking so mm -hmm. far and and there was no, you know, waiting out the storm wasn't working. And right. a lot of people said you just need to rest and you know, it wasn't working. Man. And, and some, sometimes worse. you got to do some of that. But you when you have, you know, I, I talk about distraction a lot too. You know, when people mm -hmm. distracting themselves from everything, you know, the outside world. I did that. I turned off. I didn't watch news for five years at mm -hmm. all. No, right. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. It set me off too much. Um, now I watched some, you know, there's, there's a point when, you know, you can start getting out there, but I talk a lot right. about expanding that bubble, that box, whatever that is you built around yourself to protect right. that. And that's, that's not bad at times. You need that sometimes because this is, can be extremely strong at times. Right. Right. But when you're able, you want to start expanding that bubble. You right. want to start getting outside. You want to take those small steps you're talking about. Right. And you want to start challenging yourself. It doesn't mean huge, but it means small challenges. Start to do things, you know, right. because you don't want to keep living in this tiny little bubble. None right. of us do. You know? I, I, I pretty much tell people, I say, look, I could almost gar almost guarantee you if if I worked with you and I helped put together a program that that's doable. Um yeah. 5, 10, 15% decrease in symptoms, which I think is really general, That's, really conservative. It's the number one. Yeah. Right? It sounds like what you're based on. I mean, I don't know your, your, ten, your things, but I mean, it sounds like what it's based on is very similar to a lot of the things, you know, most of us talk about too, which is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I agree. I think, you know, there's not, I don't believe there's a lot you can do to necessarily speed the healing of your nervous system. I think that's just going to take time. Right. But as you mentioned, if I can reduce the anxiety and stress, Right. I will reduce my symptomatology. You know, my, my, yeah. And there's, there's all, because it's all triggered by that anxiety. So if you can find ways like meditation, like you talked about it, like some of the stuff, exercise, all those things, right. you are going to start chipping away at that rumination loop, you Absolutely. know, that's been wiping us out. And so, yeah, it's mostly psychological principles, that's which it. comes yeah. back to you. That's what gets us through this. You right. know, I think our body has to kind of heal on its own. But we can reduce the symptoms as we're healing. Sure. You know, absolutely. And we, can, and, we, and we can improve our lives, like you and I were talking about, to be better off when we're done. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think you and yeah. I have both done that. And I think that's mm -hmm. that's the great thing. I think a lot of people I've talked to have done the same thing. It's like, you know, wow, it's like I have this new outlook on life now. You know, I still have some symptoms here and there, but man, I feel so great. I never felt this good in my life. I, you know, right. it's because, you know, it's the old, what was it? Um, What's the term? You know, the, the near death, the mm -hmm. NDEs, near death experiences. A lot of people come out of those with an entirely different outlook on life. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I think, too, you know, if you put together a recovery program that works for you, you know, uh -huh. it's just moving a little more, good diet, rumination control is massively important, right? Oh, just man. from a clinical psych yeah. perspective, because yep. it is the accelerant to every other thing in that limbic system. And it's enough to create a self fueling self-sustaining a loop of illness that will keep manifesting i mean that's that's how we get so yeah, you if you know, stop one of the ways, feeding the fire the fire will start to ease yeah the right. fire will come down yeah yes and you can look at benzo and experience it as a more of a physiological thing you don't mm -hmm. have to get swept into the undertow and develop mm -hmm. and i and i was swept under i mean i had 
all yeah. kinds of phobias, all kinds of health anxieties and DPDR. I mean, I had all of that horrific stuff. Agoraphobia. Yeah. I couldn't drive. I mean, for two years, oh, yeah. I couldn't drive my car. I think my list was 45 symptoms I had at the worst page. You know, that I've been through, you know. Yeah. You know, I talked about like the throat tightening and the swallowing. Yeah. Well, the reason why I attributed it to Ben so initially was because I had those symptoms early on. 100%. You know? And so it brought that point. back. It That's brought that point. back. But do I think that COVID was a major <clears throat> significant factor there? Absolutely. Because I've read that it's in the literature for COVID too, for long COVID. So there yeah. are other factors that fed it. But that's why I mentioned it benzo symptoms because it brought back some of my old symptoms. Right. You know? And so, yeah, I think that's probably where it's coming from. But I'm going to get checked out. You know, by mm -hmm. test because I want to make sure. Hey, I don't have a tumor in my larynx. I want to sure. make sure that I'm not. You know, I hear. And that's you. nothing wrong with that. I just no, want no, to no, check no, it no, out. No. Yeah, yeah, I hear you 100. percent And and you know, another to piggyback off that, you you had to build sort of these pathways when you were going through yeah. what you went through, right? So I went for two almost two years. I had trouble. Same thing. Very trouble. Hard time swallowing. But more than that, okay. I had the air hunger. I couldn't breathe. Yeah, you mentioned the air hunger. I thought that was fascinating. I just, yeah. I just could not I breathe. You know, I just kept thinking there's something wrong with my lungs. It's my heart. It's something, you know. Um, and when I got COVID last January, not this January, January before, I was like, wow, this feels so much like benzo. Yeah. Right? And I thought right here now, I could easily say I'm in a setback. Because it was activating all that old trauma. I remember yeah. not being able to breathe like this. I remember not being able to sleep like this. I remember waking up in the middle of the night. You know, I, you know, when I got COVID, I just woke up after like two weeks in the middle of the night one night. My heart's racing. I'm sweating. I got internal vibration. My hyperarousal system is on fire, right? Yeah. I remember all that feeling of cortisol rushing through my body to try to bring down that inflammation. I remember the adrenaline surges, the sleep, all of that, the, like I said, the hyperarousal stuff. And it was so deja vu. The insomnia alone was so oh damn man, it triggered. Well, it, well, like like the anxiety ruminations you mentioned, it just adds to every other problem. If you're not sleeping well, right? Well, then everything just keeps getting worse. Yeah, I had that for a long time. I was taking some Benadryl for a while, trying to help me sleep, and then finally I wanted to stop taking that because I felt I was becoming dependent on the Benadryl. And right, and we we try everything we can to get that sleep back. Right. You know, right. and now I sleep pretty damn well, you know, most right, of the right. time. I have some sleepless nights now and then, but it's never more than two nights in a row. Right. You right, know, right. I just, it's so much better than it was. So that's great. Yeah. But the deja vu is there. Right. And it, yeah, it brings back all of that. Like, man, this feels like benzo withdrawal. And then and it's scary because it, it's, it's frightening scary. to you. Yes. Exactly. And it's, it's stored in that limbic. Right. So that limbic system remembers that's like the most, for most of us, that, experience is probably the most horrific thing we'll ever go through i mean yes. i lost people people i was really oh, God, close yeah. to but you heal within months or you know this was a different thing this was like a slow it's like being a pow in your own body yeah. by a terrorist that is just you know committing you know doing incredible horrific experiments on your on your body and mind for a, a prolonged period it's like this yeah. is a slow damn torture this is complex mm -hmm. ptsd Right. I, I've yeah. even been, you know, using that term for years, like a, a benzo induced complex PTSD. Like I, that's going to end up in the DSM six or something. It yep. should be right. Like there has oh, to I, be there. I, PTSD has to be part of this. I mean, it's just because it's such a major life alteration. You know, right. it's an event. That's an event that significantly can affect some people. Again, right. it's an event that significantly alters some people's lives. Some people, right. But a lot of people don't have that problem. And I always want to sure. make sure it's like, so, you know, don't imagine it's you. It's just, yeah. So, but so it's, this, so, it's so hard because most, mostly, sorry, but it's okay. I think one of the hard things about us is most of what we work with is this extended protracted state and this more severe withdrawal. And thus, we create the illusion that that's what everybody's going through. Right, right. Because this is the content. But instead, it's because, well, this is who needs the help. This is who's seeking out for the help, even though it's a minority of the people. But it creates this illusion that this is most people, but it's not. Right, right. It's just these are the people that we're trying to help. Right. And they're the extreme condition people. Right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, and the, and the other thing I'd, I'd like to talk about a bit is uh -huh. kind of piggybacking off this is now I, like I said, I think Benzo, which all the, the whole ride is sort of seven headed, you know, dragon. Yeah. You mentioned that, right. You know, and the base is sort of the initial chemical impulse. Actually, I got this whole diagram that I've been creating like an animation for this. And, um, you know, and then, you know, these sort of 
pulses uh, protrude outward and we have anxiety and then anxiety leads to this, to that. And, and everything just keeps getting worse. You know what I mean? I think it's mm-hmm. multi-headed. And, and so I, I look at benzos, you know, as bigger than just chemical. I think it's like, this is for some of us, not like you said, not all I of agree. us. And even some people yeah. that came to me, they say, well, I, I had come off my Xanax twice before and I had no problems. And some, some people do. You bet Now you do. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to the show. You know, that's you just know, the that way it true. works. I've so, heard that too. People right? come up two or three times and all of a sudden, you know, that fourth time or something, now they're in a bad state. Now they're there. So, I mean, so they can see just in their own life, the argument that we're kind of putting forth. It's like, we are the outliers here, right? Yeah. To to a point, we if you got are. 30 to 100 million people uh coming on you know on benzos you one yeah, percent over those ten percent of them come off it's like man you think these numbers would be astounding right now yeah. well uh, i th- I think they're i believe that they're much larger than we know because most people don't even know that the symptoms they might be having could right. be related to their drug or they're masked by the other drugs which was my bigger Ex- argument oh yeah oh because what yeah. doctor is going to let that happen first off they're uh-huh. going to put you right back on a benzo they're going to give you five other drugs potentially to try to mask yeah. gabapentin, SSRIs, antipsychotic. I, I mean, the list. So you don't yeah, know the that's, coaching. That, yeah, that's like um. I don't know if you know the name John State. He's um a good friend of mine here in Colorado, but he's a benzo advocate, um, and he's one of those ones that's polydrug. So he's currently like tapering off of three or four different drugs. He's got a cocktail he's taking. Um, in fact, he's been um he's now seeing I think a a, a doctor in in Denver, but he's actually the one. I don't know if you saw the Netflix special. Um, recent just. A few weeks ago or a month ago, there was actually Netflix had a special on Xanax. It was called Xanax. I mean, it was part of a series they're doing. Okay. And it was on Xanax, this one. Well, anyway, right. he was he was the one featured on that. He was one of the ones featured. Um, and it had mixed information. I think you and I both, you know, it had mixed information. Um, some of it, I think, was really helpful in getting our message across about how these can be damaging. But some of it was also so many people come off them with no problem. It's not a big issue. It was mixed. But his message was on there and it's the same what you were talking about it's this the poly drugging thing and um it's so big so you don't even know what drug is causing your problems now you don't know right. what drug to start tapering you don't know yeah. which one you should start working on if you want to come out it's the confusion i did not have that complication and i can't imagine that added complications of all the different meds i was on two ssris temporarily during my my withdrawal but i didn't stay on them long i didn't right. want to you know so i right. just did it more but what you were talking about, that whole multiple drug thing, it's just, that's a whole nother area. Right. It's just, you know, because yeah. SSRIs can have their own problems. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah. yeah. And they didn't do the studies on, you know, I had, I've had oh. multiple people that literally went up to 30 different meds, oh 15 different meds, right? And I go, where's that wow. study? Where's that study? Yeah. No, it's yeah, never been do done. This. It will never and be yet, done. There's more people that have, that's happened to than you can count. It's really... There's, there's yeah, no I'd studies say. for that. No doctors, no, no damn, no. you couldn't do a study. It'd be unethical. Well, how could you? The variables are too immense. Yeah, you'd have yeah. to It'd isolate. be unethical. You're talking about you're going to give someone 15 meds? But it's not unethical to prescribe them 30 different meds. That's right. It's <laughs> such a weird man. They Doctors have a license to kill, man. They have yeah. a license to do whatever the hell they want. And you can't sue them. You can't do, I mean, that's a whole other topic. But It's very difficult. And I, I get that question. I'm sure you do. But it's a very difficult to sue them. It's just a very difficult road. And it's right. not one I wanted to tread. I wanted to recover, you know, but I know yeah, some people you, have, and there've been Lord, yeah. Lord Montague, I think the UK got a multi-million dollar settlement. It's like the largest one, but he's royalty. So he probably had the lawyers to really go after him and make a difference, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, a few other people in the UK have gotten some money, but overall, no, there's not been a lot of lawsuits that have been successful on benzodiazepines. It's just really hard to prove, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. Good luck with that. You know? Yeah. Um, Going back to the the kind of the seven headed beast idea, I've had you know those those manifestations, and this is where I think the clinical psych part mm-hmm. comes into play. Those things don't always just go away after benzos, right? So if you no. became deeply agoraphobic during the benzo process, now it's that agoraphobia was a symptom, a manifestation of benzos. Benzos yeah. not didn't come into the play. You weren't going to be you know I wasn't going to be agoraphobic, yeah. let's say. Um, but after I came off of benzos, I still was agoraphobic. Now, some people yeah. clear up. It does clear up because it's a, it's no, a for some people a, that does go away completely. It does clear up. But I see what you're up. saying, because eventually it might establish that becomes, mental state, yeah. a psychological state in your brain. And yeah, that might linger right. even once the nervous system heals. And, yeah, and I even, mean, it makes sense. And even with the people that it cleared up, it didn't clear up overnight. You know, right. No, like the examples no. I hear are, yeah. well, my anxiety levels were coming down. And so I started doing more stuff. 
well, you were then you were doing yeah. therapy. Essentially, you didn't realize that you were pushing back. But it yeah. doesn't just wake up one day and your limbic system no. goes, ha ha, um, uh, everything's yeah. safe. No, in, fa in fact, most <laughs> most of the time, it's um, people looking back and realize, oh my god, six months ago I was there. Right. You know, it's it seems it's that kind of thing where you look back six months ago. Oh my god, I have come a ways because you don't notice it. It's so subtle and it's so slow how the changes happen sometimes. You know, absolutely. But, so I've had many clients that were, um, you know five, six years removed and they were, they reach out to me and said, I've tried everything, everybody, um, you know, again, the bend thing, I think it's bend. I think it's this. Yeah, we, said, we, well, we call it bind. I bind. Don't the, yeah. That's what I was calling it. And then people you, kept calling it yeah. bend. It's well, bind. I, mean, probably, I had it right. Just, just like they may be misinterpreting what we meant by it. They might be <laughs> it's the wrong acronym. <laughs> that's the, that's we, we, use bind, we use bind. It, it, the team that created it, we call it bind. Let's put it that way. That's okay. what I was calling it initially. And yeah. someone corrected well, me. Because said it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a description of the state too. We thought the acronym was good because it's kind of a binded state that you can Yeah, be right, in, right. You know, and we thought bind was a good term for it. So that's right. Cool. So, you know, when these people come to me and they're, and they're going, well, I have bind, uh, not always, but you know, they, they, they use these terms, but it, protracted, you know, is the, yeah, the one they usually get. I still say protracted a lot. I'll say them together because I know most people don't know the term bind. So I still say right. protracted withdrawal. Yeah. Right. But they'll say, look, it's six years out. I'm still having protracted, let's say. And they go, yeah. okay, what's going on? I can't leave my house. I can't drive. Mm -hmm. And my hypo, you know, they don't know it, but this is what I'm hearing is my my hypoarousal system is through the roof. I have internal buzzes and sensations and all of this. And they go, okay, you can't leave the house. I said, that's interesting. I said, well, let's, why don't we work on that? Yeah. No, it's part of uh, protracted. It, uh, it's mm, an, yeah. I don't think I so, that. but let's try it. Let's run the experiment, right? If it doesn't work, if treatment doesn't work, then you're right. But if treatment does work, then maybe we can restore some quality of life here. Yeah. And I say, listen, agoraphobia is another one of these things that like rumination gets treated like it's some kind of lesser symptom. I said, mm -hmm. agoraphobia is very serious. What yeah. that is, is your limbic system now saying, I have endured so much trauma. I have come to distrust this whole environment around me, even in my internal mm -hmm. body so much now that I'm going to to protect you. I'm going to shut down access to everything, right? I said it's almost like the same response that someone on a battlefield laying in you know a fetal position in a little hole. I got you. While bombs are going off around them, I'm like yeah. that's what you're hearing. I said mm -hmm. so. The, the the amount of trauma, the amount of revved up hypoarousal for one, right? So hypoarousal is typical in like PTSD. It's just it's I sort of explained like a panic attack is like slamming your foot on the gas pedal of the limbic, like. The pair of the, of the sympathetic nervous system, right? It's just boom, you hit the gas, the, the RPMs go up to 10. You feel like you're yeah. going to blow your motor and then they come back down. I said hyperarousal was like resting a heavy foot on the gas pedal. It ramps up to about four or five and it just idles there. Stays in, there full time. Yeah. In some ways, it's it's more damaging because it never comes down. It just stays there. You know, sometimes we, we use, it's, it's the same analogy. We, we use the gas all the time. We, we usually refer to the gas pedals glutamate. Um, mm -hmm. Just trying to simplify things. I know there's other factors right. at play. Right. Uh, 